We're getting to the end of this strange semester. Today we will cover uh, the Ilmarinen cycle, which is uh, only two runos, uh, 37 and 38, the Golden Bride and Girl into Gaul. And then we'll start the third Vainamoinen cycle, which is when we're really now getting into the, the core of what the Kalevala is all about. And we'll, uh, so we'll cover 39 through 44, and uh, leave uh, the rest uh, for uh, next time and uh, cover that at the same time as we, we cover the final runo, which is runo number 50. So uh, the Ilmarinen cycle, the short cycle here, um, very poignant though, what uh, we have here is Ilmarinen who is really grieving. Remember what happened last time in the Kullervo cycle, where Ilmarinen's wife, Lo, his daughter, the maiden from, uh, the, from Northland, uh, who had become this uh, mean woman who had actually baked the stone into Kullervo's bread. Um, and which then ended up causing her own death because Kullervo got so uh, upset about it. Um, uh, Kullervo didn't kill her, uh, her himself. He had bears and wolves uh, kill her. But now we have Ilmarinen, who is a widower, a relatively young widower. He uh, is uh, alone and he is really, really grieving. He, he, he seemed to have really loved his uh, wife, uh, uh, despite the fact that she wasn't an all-around good person, but you know, it's a human, human trait. Um, and uh, he, is, he is weeping. In, in the Kalevala we have men who weep. So that, that happens actually quite often. So here Ilmarinen is mourning. He quits working altogether. Uh, he cannot face his life as a widower. So he decides he's going to have to make himself a, a wife. He replace the dead wife by a golden bride, a golden uh, wife and he starts, uh, he, he collects um, after weeping. So he wept two, three months till the fourth month. He picked gold coins from the sea, some silver coins from the waves. He gathered a stack of wood and he starts uh, building, uh, forging a wife of metal, of, of gold. Uh, for, her, for himself. Of course, he doesn't manage the first time. He has his slaves working and using the bellows. And, and first out comes a ewe, a female uh, sheep. Then out comes a foal. And then at the third attempt, uh, she uh, arises from from the from the uh, smith's uh, fire and here we have um, have a uh, a golden bride for Ilmarinen um, looks fine but uh, Ilmarinen himself says she'd be a fine maid if she were able to talk if she had a will a tongue um, so he immediately realizes this, that this, this person is not talking and it's not a person, it's not talking, it's just, you know, this golden, golden metal woman. And uh, yet he goes to bed with uh, his golden wife and, um, and uh, finds her cold. Uh, and unresponsive, obviously. So what he decides to do is, what am I going to do with this? I don't want to be, you know, sleeping with this this cold, golden uh, wife, which doesn't speak, doesn't respond. It's just a thing. And he thinks, hmm, who would, who could be using, who could, who could find this useful? 
of course, you know, his, his uh, buddy Väinämöinen um, has tried in vain multiple times by now to get himself a wife, you know, Aino first and the maid maid of Pohjola, and uh, it didn't work. Um, so he's like, okay, uh, actually Ilmarinen had taken the, taken the wife that also, uh, also Väinämöinen wanted. So Ilmarinen decides, okay, well, well uh, maybe in order to kind of like, uh, I, I took the, I took the uh, maid from Pohjola and, and she chose me, so let me give you this golden bride. And Väinämöinen, this is kind of like the comic, most comical, one of the most comical uh, places in the Kalevala. So, um, so after Ilmarinen decides that this is no good to me, I'll take the maid to Väinäland to care for Väinämöinen, for a lifelong maid upon his knee, for a hen under his arm, and he takes the maid, the golden doll, big human-sized doll, to, to Väinämöinen, and says, hello, old Väinämöinen, Here's a girl for you, a maid for a, a maid fair to look upon. Nor is she a chatterbox, not all that wide in the jaws, so she's not like you know nagging constantly. No, of course not, because she's not alive. Vanamoon's reaction is, why have you brought this to me, this golden bugbear? <laughs> And uh, Ilmarinen says, why else than for good, for a lifelong mate upon your knee, for a hen under your arm. Ilmarinen is kind of like really tone deaf to, to these, these things. And Vanamoon says, oh my little smith brother, thrust your mate into the fire, for a forge from her all tools, or take her to Russia, bring your figure to Germany, for rich men to be rivals, great men to fight over her. This is not fitting for my kin, nor for me myself, to woo a woman of gold, to work on one of silver. And Vanamoinen takes this a little bit further and makes like a teaching out of this, saying that, um, that people should not be looking for gold, gold and treasures, do not luckless boys, fellows just growing, whether you're wealthy, even if you're not, ever in this world, not in a month of Sundays, again this formula, not in a month of Sundays, which would never happen, uh, don't woo a woman of gold or work on one of silver, for the gleam of gold is cold and silver's glitter is chill. So then he, he makes it into this bigger teachable moment in a way. So uh, what happens next is uh, they, Ilmarinen tosses away the golden bride and uh, he decides what, what is he going to do, where is he going to get a wife now? Um, well, he decides to go back to Northland and ask for the sister, younger sister of his dead wife to be his new wife. So, um, so uh, he starts going to the Northland, of course meets Lohi there, and Lohi's the first question, the obvious question, Lohi the mother asks, so how is my daughter doing? Where is she? And, um, and uh, that, I mean, this Lohi is Ilmarinen's mother-in-law, and Ilmarinen says, don't, my dear mother-in-law, don't ask about that, how your daughter is living, your darling is getting on, doom has savaged her, a hard end has struck. In the earth is my berry, in the heath my beautiful, my black-browed one in the grass, my silver one in the hay. <laughs> so, but he goes directly to the point of his being in Northland, he's coming back there, so okay, so your daughter is dead, how about you give me your other daughter, I've come for your other girl, for your younger maid, give my dear mother-in-law and put your, uh, put, uh, put your other daughter where my late wife lived, 
in her sister's place. So he's just looking for a replacement. And uh, Lohi, the mistress of Northland, is like first lamenting the, the fact that she had allowed her daughter to be Ilmarinen's wife um, and, uh, and thus kind of like, you know, inadvertently contributed to her demise. And uh, Ilmarinen uh, keeps asking, uh, the mother says, I'll not put my girl to sweep, to sweep up your suit, to scrub off your muck. I'll sooner put my daughter, place my baby child into a roaring rapid, into a smoking whirlpool, in the land, in the deadlands, burbot mouth on the teeth of Tuoni's pike. So she'd rather have her younger daughter be dead also rather than give him to Ilmarinen. Um, fair enough. Um, it's, it wasn't a good ending for Ilmarinen's wife. And um, then Ilmarinen doesn't give up. He's like, okay, the mother says no, but I'm going to go and ask the girl herself. And, um, and she goes to the girl and says, right, come with me, girl, in your sister's place where my late wife lived to, be, to bake honey bread and to brew the beer. So uh, on the floor we have we have this image quite often in the Kaleva, uh, or occasionally that there is a child on the floor and the child says some really wise things, little child. So um, on page five or seven, they are kind of like these soothsayers. They tell the to tell the truth, but a child sang from from the floor, both sang and declared. Be off, extra one, from our stronghold, strange man from these, these doors. You destroyed a block of the stronghold. You damaged a bit of the stronghold when you came before, when you reached the doors. Maiden, your sister, don't be, char don't be charmed by the bridegroom, by the bridegroom's speeches, nor yet by his fine feet. So he's got wolf's gums, uh, fox's legs in his pocket. And this child tells the girl, do, do not, do not say yes. Um, the maid herself uh, is of the same opinion and says to Ilmarinen, I will not go off with you, nor do I care for bird brains. You killed the wife you wedded. You slew my sister. You'd go on to kill me too. You'd slay me as well. So what does Ilmarinen do? He, uh, you know, he has been told no by the mother-in-law, no by the girl herself. The child had from the floor. Even the even the child has uh, confirmed that that uh, they shouldn't agree to Ilmarinen's uh, proposal. So, um, what does he do? He uh, just abducts the girl. He grabs the girl that minute wrapped his paws round her, whirled outdoors as snow, hurled himself toward his sledge, thrust the girl into the sledge, dumped her in his sleigh, and straight off he went, prepared to depart, on one hand on the stallion's rein, and one on the maid's nipples. Abuse. Uh, very bad. And uh, so he just, you know, wants to have his way. Just like Bulle, <laughs> you know, abducting the girl first. But in this case, the, the maid weeps and she groans and, um, and she uh, moans and complains and um, keeps on moaning and complaining, uh, comparing Ilmarinen to a, a predator, uh, a predatorial beast and uh, and is not Ilmarinen is not able uh, to woo her like Gullero was to woo her his own sister. So the girl says I will I will um, uh, break your your sleigh just like Gullero's sister said to Gullero. 
and uh, he, then she starts insulting Ilmarinen, uh, calls him wrinkle face, and uh, it wasn't a happy trip from the Northland farm towards Kalevala, uh, where Ilmarinen came from. So um, calls him, um, calls him, uh, she calls him wrinkle face. For a fox coat is fair, a fox muzzle more comely, and uh, compares him to, to animals, saying that they, 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 animals are more pleasing to her than Ilmarinen. And um, they, they uh, travel in the sleigh. It's a long trip, takes several days. And they need to uh, stop and feed the horse and rest themselves. And so they they come into a village, and um, and what happens is tired from the journey, the smith sleeps soundly, and someone else seduces the wife of the sleepy man. So uh, when they get to this place where they stay over in, in this village, the, uh, the girl goes uh, with other men. And this is now, you know, Ilmarinen's second, second wife. And when Ilmarinen wakes up, he finds out about this. And, uh, and, and he's obviously mad about it. And he says, shall I start to sing and sing such a bride to the forest for the forest's own or to water for the water's own? I'll not sing her for the forest's own. All the forest would take it amiss, nor yet for the water's own. The fishes would shear away. I will sooner fell her with my brand and dispatch her with my sword. So first he kills, he, he, he threatens to kill, but then the sword starts speaking, we have had speaking swords before, and the sword, this is this animistic approach, and, uh, and the sword says, surely I have not been shaped to dispatch women or to fell the mean, so the sword refuses to kill the the girl who has betrayed Ilmarinen. Uh, well, kind of, you know, Ilmarinen abducted her against her will, so we won't blame her. Um, it wasn't a well played out uh, scene on the part of Ilmarinen. So, uh, what does Ilmarinen do if he cannot, if the sword refuses to kill? kill this woman, uh, of course it's the man's honor here in question, and um, so what does he do? He starts to sing, like these Kalevala men do. So, yeah, and now Ilmarinen started to sing, was wroth enough to recite, sang his woman, woman to a gull. So here we get the, the title, girl into a gull, a seagull into a bird, and uh, and that's, you know, shifted the shape of the girl uh, by his singing. And this is what, you know, what these, these singers, the power of these words, what they can achieve. You can, you, you, you can change your own shape sometimes. It doesn't happen that, that often, but it does occasionally in the Kalevala and you can sing these other people. Remember in the, in the very beginning where uh, Vainamönen sings Jopahainen into the, into the bog, into the swamp, just sings him there. And, uh, and now uh, Ilmarinen uh, found his revenge by singing the girl. Um, so what does he do? He, uh, the girl is now a gull. <laughs> Then uh, the smith Ilmarinen into his sledge flings himself and hurdles along, his head down, in bad spirits. He traveled to his own lands, he came to the lands he knew. Of course, wh whom does he meet there? He meets Vainamönen there on the road 
and uh, and Vanderman is like brother Smith Ilmarin and why are you in bad spirits helmet all askew are you come back from Northland what is life in Northland like so uh, Ilmarin and what is he gonna answer um, he tells what has happened but what is important is that he, uh, for the plot of the Kalevala, he says, what a life it is in Northland. There the sampo is grinding, the bright lid is swiveling. One day it grounds things to eat, the second day things to sell, the third thing things to store at home. Um, so, what uh, Ilmarinen is basically saying that I wouldn't have cared that people in the Northland, that Lohi, his mother-in-law, has the sample if he had managed to get the second girl to be his wife, but because he didn't, something needs to be done about the sample. It's the, the envy, in a way, he has forged the sample himself and he didn't really end up getting any any permanent happiness uh, from from doing it because the happiness that his first wife provided him is now gone because she was killed by the wolves and the bears. So um, the people in Northland they are prosperous because of the sample that Ilmarinen made for them. So we're coming back to the motif of the sample and, um, and uh, what they decide to do at the end of this, this Ilmarinen cycle is to go to the Northland. Um, but before, before they decide to do that, Ilmarinen confesses what he has done. I sang a woman like that to a gull on a sea crag. Now as a gull, she sprawls out. As a sea mew, she cackles. She growls on the wet rocks and on reefs, she yells. That's where the Ilmarinen cycle ends. And, uh, and he, he was honest about it to, to Vainamon and told him what he had done. So, um, so we start uh, the Vanamonen cycle, the third Vanamonen cycle. This is kind of like the key of what happens there. There is this sample that, uh, that the Kalevala men have provided for the men in, for Lohi, the woman, in Northland and everybody that is in her community. And now they have dis decided that this is not good. <laughs> we are poor here because we don't have the sample and the people in Northland are doing wonderfully because they have the sample. So uh, if so, we get into the climax of this epic, the, uh, the stealing of the sample. And before you can steal the sample, you have to have to go there. And, uh, and so then and, and, and Ilmarin and they have they have this, this idea that, you know, we'll, we're just going to go there and, and get it, and how do we get there? They have a little bit of a disagreement because Ilmarinen wants to take the land route and Vainamönen wants to take the water route, and Vainamönen is, okay, all right, I'll, I'll adapt, let's take, the, let's take the land route. So he's not, like, insisting here on page 516, Vainamönen says, be that as it may, since it seems you are no sailor, let's travel by land, struggle along shores, struggle along shores. But he clearly wants to go by the uh, water route. Uh, and uh, then they need swords. Ilmarinen forges a sword for Vainamoinen. It's a wonderful sword so we have even in this epic we have an important sword it doesn't have a name though like the the swords in the icelandic saga saga of the volsung's beowulf uh, but there is a sword 
And then, um, so Van Emmenen agrees to go the land route, even though he really doesn't want to, but how is this thing resolved? They end up going via the water route uh, because there's a weeping boat who is a speaking po boat as well. So there's this boat uh, on, the, on the moorings and it's, it was a craft weeping, a little boat complaining again, you know, animism here, we have these talking things. And uh, Van Emmenen asks the boat, why do you weep, wooden craft, strong rock lo locked, row locked boat? Why complain? Do you weep your woodenness brood over your Rolox strength? And the boat is just like crying and saying, I haven't been, nobody has been rowing me anywhere. I've been, I've been here and there are maggots growing at my bottom, these worst earthworms. And, and I would really like to be He's just complaining about it. it. It is complaining about its fate of being abandoned there. And uh, Van Emmenen says, 520, Don't weep, wooden craft. Boat with strong rowlocks. Don't fuss. Soon you will be off to war, trudging off to fights. If you craft are the Lord's work, the Lord's work, the giver's gift, edge on, you'll rush into water. And uh, the, the, uh, the, then uh, the, the boat is saying, but I need, you know, people really rowing me. Bannerman is trying to say, I'll just push you there and, and, uh, and you, you'll get to go. But, uh, but the boat keeps saying, I, I need a human to row me. So not just, you know, push me to the water. And, um, and all of a sudden, it seems that uh, Hilmarinen agrees uh, to go with the boat. They get other people there and, uh, and they make the boat ready to go to the Northland to do this raid, which had only one goal to get the Sampo from Lohis. Uh, Lois uh, keep safe there in the Northland. So, uh, so they get into the boat and there are other people as well going there and they start the journey. And who do they see on the way there uh, before they get too far? They see Lemmingainen. So this is on page 524. Headland looms on the way, and a wretched village gleams. Ahti dwells on the headland, far mind underneath its arm. Far mind with uh, a lack of fish, Lemmingainen, lack of bread. Ahti, his, his sheds littleness, the rogue, his rations, smallness. So uh, Lemminkainen, remember he has these several names, he's Farmine, he's Ahti, um, he's the lover boy, and uh, after his, uh, his uh, latest adventure with Tiera, he's his friend, when they wanted to go back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, um, to the Northland uh, to avenge uh, the Northlanders um, burning down Lemmingannon's home, which they did because Lemmingannon killed the master of Northland and been an obnoxious person all around. Um, they um, he, he has kind of kind of sort of settled down uh, to live in this poor place with his mother. Um, Kulik is not mentioned, but obviously she was there as well. Uh, and it, but he's ready to go again. So he sees Ilmarinen and Vainamoinen on the boat, clearly, you know, with the swords and everything, clearly going somewhere exciting. And Lemmikainen is, I'll come along. And uh, they uh, take him along. So we have these three. We've got. Uh, Vainamainen, Ilmarinen, and now Lemminkainen in the boat going up to, uh, to steal the sample. 
And uh, yeah, so we have the three studies on the way. Um, and we get to the next one, which is the pike. Um, so everything's going pretty smoothly. They are rowing, they're, they're making, making way, and uh, all of a sudden the bolt gets stuck. So they think this is some kind of a, some kind of a reef or some kind of a stone there at the bottom of the sea. But what it turns out to be is a giant pike and uh, the, the, the boat got stuck on the back of the pike. And uh, then what to do, the pike, they need to continue, uh, continue their trip and, uh, and, and uh, somebody needs to do something about it. And so Lemmingham is like, okay, I'll go and, I'll go and, uh, go and try. So he ends up um, trying to cut the pike out from underneath the boat. Uh, but what happens is uh, he ends up in the water, toppled in the water, for, uh, fists first plunged in the below, and that Smith Ilmarinen seized the fellow by the locks, hoisted the man from the sea, and he put in, uh, this into words. All has been fashioned into a man, made to wear a beard, to add up to a hundred, to fill out to a thousand. So, so uh, you know, you're not basically a, a, a man if you can't do, I will try. And so Ilmarinen tries and um, it doesn't manage. And then Vainamonen tries and uh, at that old Vainamonen hosted up the fish, he dragged the pike out of the water. Um, and the pike broke in, into, into two. The tail sank to the bottom, the head jumped into the skiff. So they have now this pike's head in the, in the, in the boat. And what are they going to do about that? Uh, this is one of, the, one of the key points that Vainamonen ends up fashioning, manufacturing a, uh, a gantele from the pikes, pike's jaw bones. And uh, so we have uh, a pike bone cantele. So cantele is, uh, and I sent you yesterday, I sent you a, a, a very short YouTube video about what a cantele is and how it sounds. It's actually a, um, a YouTube video from the, the development of the cantele through all the ages. The first cantele that you hear the, there is the, this kind of a five string cantele that is relatively simple uh, and then it, it has developed. Uh, it's it's this, uh, this ancient instrument that is still being played in, in Finland and there are professional cantele players and, uh, and, you know, there are electric cantelas today and, and so on. So just, you know, if you, if you want to get an idea of what kind of a sound you hear from cantelas, it's, um, it's a, a, a kind of a zither um, type instrument, string instrument that you play, you have it, uh, have it on your lap and you, you play it. Very simple, but the sound is extremely beautiful. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, take a quick listen of that so you, you kind of can put this all in perspective. And uh, so, so what else do you do with this pike, pike head that is now in the, in the, um, in the boat? So Vainamonen starts to make it into a cantele uh, from, from this pike's jaw bones and, um, and the, the rest of it they eat. So he tells the, the young women there who are accompanying them um, go and fix food for it. So Vanemir now has this new instrument and he starts to play it. Of course, he's a singer himself initially. He's a singer. He's been singing quite a, quite a, quite a, at many places at weddings and and a uh, wedding singer Vanemir and um, and he sings 
people. He, he does his magic with his singing. He, the words in his singing are, are magic. And now he has this instrument to accompany him, and he starts playing. And it seems that um, it seems that uh, it's something magical that he has created. First, other people try to try to use it and play, but they can't. Nobody else seems to be able to do it. But um, Vanamoen can make the kambele sound really beautiful. It sounds so beautiful that animals come to listen. Forest God comes to listen. His name is Tapio. He comes to listen. His wife comes to listen. Birds come to listen. Fish come to listen. Uh, the water god, whose name is Ahti. So Tapio is the forest god. Ahti is the water god. Uh, Ahti also comes to comes to listen. Uh, page 541. Ahto, Ahto, oh, Ahti. King of the billows, the waters, grass, bearded lord, draws himself to the surface, glides on a water lily. There he listened to the joy, and he put this into words. I have not heard such before, ever in this world, as Vainamoinen's music, as the eternal bard's joy. Uh, this is not just music that Vanamoni creates. The music is a symbol for, for this national idea of, of culture, the soul of a people that finds its expression in Vanamoni's singing. So people listen, they are really moved by this song. Everyone cries, the music is so wonderful and so beautiful and uh, even Vainamon in himself cries um, a raven came flapping and old Vainamon said raven fetch my tears from below the clear water um, raven can't bring back Vainamon and tears but then there's a, a scalp uh, another bird which goes and brings back Vanamonen's tears caused by the beauty of this music and uh, they have turned into pearls. So uh, it's, it's just something magical, the music is magical. Well, if you, if you love music, you can, you can relate to this. So um, they're still on the way and on the way Vanamonen they created this beautiful instrument, beautiful sounding instrument from the jaw bone, bones of the pike. But now we get in 42, in rumor number 42, we get to action, <laughs> really, really to the action, the core of the, of the, of the, of the plot, uh, stealing the sample. And um, so they get, they get to the Northland, Steady old Vainamoinen, next the smith Ilmarinen, third the wanton lover boy, he the fair far mind, but the same person, went off upon the clear sea, upon the vast waves, yonder to the cold village into dark northland, the man eating, the fellow drowning place. So it's not depicted as a friendly place, and we have seen that there's always conflict. When, whenever anyone goes up there, they're somehow weirdly drawn into this place, but whenever they go, something bad happens. And there's Lohi, uh, Ilmarinen's, um, Ilmarinen's uh, mother-in-law, uh, even though the girl is now, the Ilmarinen's wife is dead, he's there and he's like, he sees these three stooges coming, and he's like, um, what message do the men have? What news the fellows? Well, Vanamon doesn't beat around the bush. He tells right, he goes into business right away and uh, answers all his question. 
uh, the men's message concerns the Sampo. The fellows news the bright lid. We've come to share the Sampo, to look out for the bright lid. So he offers to share the Sampo. That's what they had, you know, kind of like initially said that, you know, we, we can share all this wealth, but no, that wasn't good for, for Lohi. So uh, Lohi answers immediately. No grouse can be shared by two. Grouse is a small animal. No, nor a squirrel by three men. It is good that the Sampo hums and the brightly churns away within Northland's rocky hill and inside the copper slope. It is good too that I am the keeper of the great Sampo. So she doesn't hesitate to tell them what what she thinks about this whole situation. So, you know, you can you can ask to share, but I, this is my opinion. Uh, we have a problem. So what does Vainamonen do? Vainamonen pulls out the beautiful sounding pike jawed uh, kantele, pike bone uh, kantele, and he starts playing. And, um, and, and. This is, you know, when Lohi is starting to put Lohi, Lohi sees that this is big trouble and she starts pulling his men together and, you know, this, this fighting force against uh, the Kalevala men. And uh, so Vanaman starts playing the pike bone kantele and everyone loves it. So he sees his kantele, he sat down to play, began to play prettily and they all stopped to listen, marvel at the merriment. And what happens, he continues to sing and people become drowsy. These are the Northland people, you know, the Northland warriors and Lohi, the formidable woman. And uh, all the listeners fell asleep. The watchers sank down. The young slept and the old slept at Vainamuna's music. Then the shrewd Vainamunen, the everlasting wise man, groped in his pocket, fumbled in his purse. He then, he takes sleep needles, this is, I don't know what sleep needles are, but he smeared their eyes with sleep, knits up the lashes and locked up the lids of the weary folks, not like physically, but, but, uh, but with, his, with his song. So he sings them all to sleep, and then, now everybody's sleeping there in the Northland, uh, let's go and get the Sampo. Of course the Sampo is behind locks, it's inside a rock mountain, uh, behind, behind locks, not only one lock, but nine locks, and an inner vault, the tenth. So they go there to that rocky hill, the copper slope, uh, and uh, they, uh, try to figure out how to how to break these locks while well, they have Ilmarinen there. And with butter he smeared the locks, the hinges with fat, lest the doors would uh, should creak and the hinges mew. The locks he eased loose with his fingers, the bolts he slipped with a hoe, now as though in bits the locks turned and uh, the strong doors swung open. So, so Ilmarinen's skills as a smith turned out to be useful, and um, and then uh, what is what is Lemminkainen's contribution going to be here? Uh, uh, Vainamoinen says, "Oh, you wanton lover boy, for most of my friends go take this sampo and tug the uh, right leg." And Lemminkainen tries to pull, get the sampo, and he boasts on the way. What of man there is in me, what of fellow in the old man's son, by it may the sampo be shifted and the bright lid turned with the help of my right foot with a touch of my shoe heel. So this is going to be easy peasy, I'll just, you know, I'll just go and, go and get the sampo, I'm, I'm this, you know, uh, macho person like Lenningen and always presents himself. Uh, but it doesn't work. Uh, Sampo is heavy and it has grown its roots uh, in the, into the depth of nine fathoms, fathoms being 
an old-fashioned measure of length. So it has these long, long roots, and uh, how are they going to get it out now that, you know, while the Northland people are still sleeping? So there is an ox, they go and get an ox, a very strong-framed ox, and, and uh, with the ox they uh, plow uh, the sambos roots and uh, sambo starts to move and they get the get the sambo uh, away from its hiding place where it had been churning these three wonderful things uh, uh, corn, money and salt for the Northland people, for Lohi. So now they have the sambo and um, then what are we going to do next? We need to get it to, to the boat, but Ilmarinen hasn't really thought about things this far. He's like, where shall the Sambo be brought? Which way shall it be conveyed from these bad places from Lockless Northland? Vainamelin has an answer for everything he says. There shall the Sambo be brought and the bride lit fetched to the misty headlands tip to the foggy island's end, that it may be lucky there and dwell there always. There's a little room there, just a bit of space, with no eating, no beating, no meeting a man's sword. So it's a peaceful place where, where the sambo uh, will be put. And uh, they get the sambo to the boat and um, pray to the water god, ah, oh, give, give oars of yours, a boat of yours, water master, new and better oars, another firmer paddle, apply yourself to the oars, settle down the row, row. Uh, let the wooden craft run, let the iron row locked cleave through the steep foam and the froth cape waves. So they start the, the journey. And they row, and they row. It's a long journey, they've got the sample there now. Um, Lemminkainen is this one who gets easily bored and because this is a long, long trip it seems that they have had a successful outcome, they got what they, what they wanted from the Northland, they've got the sample there in the, in the boat and Lemminkainen gets bored, he's like, uh, I want some entertainment here, so, um, so he wants singing, he wants uh, Vainamönen to sing. Um, he says uh, on page 552, once upon a time as a rower had water, so a singer had a tail. But not nowadays do we ever hear lilting in the boat, singing in the waves. So he's complaining that there is no music here. Um, Vainamönen says no, no, this is not the time. This is not the time we we will be we will start singing once we see our own home shores, and time passes away and um, and and Lemmikäinen is bored continues to be even more bored. He says, "Why won't you sing, Vanemöinen, and hum, man of good waters? Now you've got the good sample and set your course straight." So Vanemann uh, has to say it's too, too early for singing, too, too be times for merriment. If our own doors were in sight and our ga own gates were, uh, were creaking, then we could make merry. Uh, Lemmingannon doesn't give up. Um, he says, okay, if you don't sing, I will sing. And Lemmingannon starts singing, but he can't sing well. He can hold up, hold a tune. So even though he cannot sing, he starts singing, and and uh, he uh, the wretch burst out cuckooing with his surly voice, with his rasping uh, throat. Once in Lemmingannon sang, far mind bellowed out. His mouth moved and his beard sh shook and his jaws quivered. The song was heard, you can guess what's, what's going to happen. The song was heard further off. The trill across the waters was heard in, in six villages over seven seas. So there is a crane that hears this and you know he's just you know the crane is minding his own business counting its toes, toe bones 
and uh, and he hears the, the the crane here crane the bird hears the singing and it flies off to Northland and then when it got there and arrived on the North Swamp it was still screeching harshly and uh, shrilly, shrilly yelling that way it awoke Northland roused the evil power so it was like <sighs> Lemminkainen's Lemminkainen's uh, Kind of, he's in, in he's, he's so just gets bored, so he needs entertainment. So he causes the crane to hear his horrible singing. The crane goes and wakes up the people in the north. And lo, he wakes up. And the first thing he, he thinks is somebody must have stolen something. He went to the, uh, he, he went to the cow shed and uh, counted his cows and all the cows are here so he, she knew immediately that these three stooges from the Kalevala must have taken the sample and she's right she goes and checks uh, inside this rock hill behind all these logs uh, the sample is gone um, a stra uh, woe luckless me for my days says Lohi a stranger has been here made all the locks quiver, moved the stronghold gates, broken the iron hinges. Could the Sampo have been got from here, taken without Libby? Yeah, so it's, it's gone and uh, Lohi is obviously very, very upset. You know, she knows exactly what has happened. And she uh, also has magic. So she prays to Mist Daughter, Mist Girl, Fog Maiden, Sift Mist, Mist with the Sieve, Waft some fog, wa waft some fog about, Drop slime down from heaven, Let a haze down from the sky, On the clear high seas, Upon the open expanse, To cut Vainamunen off, Stop the man of calm waters. And uh, not only the mist uh, uh, that she, she, she sends to fall over the sea so that, uh, so that Benjamin doesn't know where they are rowing, uh, she also sends uh, a monster, sea monster. In uh, the original sea monster's name is Iku. Also, <laughs> and, and it's just referred to as sea monster. Is this in this translation, sea monster, the gaffer's son, and uh, and this one she sends to Benjamin's boat as well, and drown those of calm waters, destroy the vicious fellows underneath the deep below, deep billows bring the sample to Northland without rolling from the vaults. And uh, then the fog settles, the sea monster attacks the boat and, um, and yet they, they win <laughs> the sea monster, um, but and the sea monster goes away, so it was just kind of like this, this uh, quick squ uh, scare uh, for, the, for the men who are with the sample going back home. Uh, but Lohi had also prayed or, or, or egged on the old man, the, you know, the central god, the old man, the chief god, uh, to send a storm to the sea. So if the fog doesn't doesn't help if the if the uh, sea monster Ikutusu, if that doesn't doesn't help it then send a storm to the seas uh, to rock venomous both but but make sure that the sample <laughs> stays stays there. And uh, so the wind started blowing and the billows are running the vessel they bore Vainamönen's harp of pipe bones, the candele of fish fins, for the wave 
wives, people's good, people's good, Ahtolan's joy forever. So the kantele drops into the water from the from the boat. And devastating thing, there it went down to the bottom of the sea um, to Ahto, Ahto's land, Ahti Bo Ahto, uh, variations of the writing of his name. So he's the sea god and uh, his wave wives wife's uh, uh, territory down at the bottom of the sea. Um, devastating for Vanamoinen because it's not just, you know, this is an instrument that can be easily uh, easily replaced, even though he ends up doing that later. Uh, there goes my best instrument. So much for what I have done, there goes my best instrument. My joy forever is lost. No more shall I have ever in this world joy of a pike's tooth fishbone melody. And, uh, and, and, um, so that was kind of horrible, but uh, it, it becomes worse because this is um, this next one, Battle at the Sea, is the culmination of the battle between, we have had this battle between Kalevala, which is the place where Vainamon and, and, and uh, Ilmarinen live and then uh, Northland. So there is this constant feud, this constant tension, even, even when uh, there is a like, a, like a positive thing, that there's a marriage uh, between the Northland maiden and Ilmarinen, who is from Kalevala. Even in the, in the wedding, uh, the, there was this tension because Lemminkainen wasn't invited, and and so he goes and murders the, you know, the um, the bride's father. <laughs> so uh, so it's 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 throughout this, and here we get to the actual battle. There is now a an actual sea battle, battle at sea. So Lohi calls the the men uh, uh, in Northland together. She armed the crowd with their crossbows, equipped the men with their swords. She made ready the North's craft, prepared the war boat, mustered the men in her ship, prepared the warriors as a scout, its young, as a teal masters, masters its uh, chicks. A hundred swordsmen, a thousand fellows with bows, she erected masts, fitted canvas trees, hoisted sails upon the mast, mast, canvas on the trees, like a long cloud bank, a mass of cloud in the sky, and then she cast off. She both went and sped to try and get the Sambo out of Vainamönen's boat. So she prepares for the battle, prepares the ship, uh, commands the ship. She is the, the ultimate female uh, leader of, uh, of an army in this, uh, in, this runo, uh, in this runo battle at the C-43. So uh, there, the, 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 uh, the Kantele is gone. They lost the Kantele, but they haven't lost the Sampo. There are the, the three guys going back home with the Sampo with great expectations of how prosperous they will now be, that the, the Sampo is going to be churning these good, good th three things for them. And uh, Venomen yet becomes kind of, a, uh, kind of worried a little bit and sends a lover boy, let me get into the mast and see, see what you can see from there, do you see anyone? Uh, because of course they know that when the when the Northland people wake up, they will notice that the Sampo is gone, and they won't just you know say okay, the Sampo is gone, let's move on. Uh, they know that there are consequences. There will be a battle, and um, 
and they just don't know how this is going to go. And Bayern Munich has, has this, you know, funny feeling that they may be followed, and so they are, except, you know, Lemmingham doesn't really, he's like, oh, there's nothing, I can't see anything here. Um, just, you know, um, all clear, the weather ahead, but gloomy, the sky astern, there is a small cloud northward, a uh, cloud bank to the northwest, and this cloud bank, Bannerman knows that, you know, you have to, you have to look more carefully, and, uh, and then it turns out to be Lohi and Lohi's army uh, following them. And uh, Vanaman does his magic again. Uh, he he uh, throws uh, some, uh, you know, some uh, items to the water, uh, which temporarily uh, allow uh, the Lohi boat to get stuck there. He he's let let this become a reef, grow into a hidden island. Uh, for the North's craft to run on the hundred rowlocks to split, where the sea storm chafes, where the wave scratches. So it gets uh, Lois, uh, Lois uh, boat gets uh, stuck on this reef that Vanaman and created by his by his magic. Uh, but Lohi is not a stupid military leader. Uh, either and says what is the best plan, what is to be done, and she changes shape, her own shape, and she becomes someone else. She took up five scythes, six holes past their prime, she fashioned them into claws, fitted them to be her feet, she, she shattered part of the craft she put under her, uh, she, the sides she slapped into wings, the rudder to be her tail, put a hundred men under a wing, a thousand at her tail tip. So uh, here is the cover picture. If you look at that, it's by Akseli Kale and Kalela, a picture of Lohi having shape-shifted herself into this monster with wings and a tail. Uh, sometimes referred to as, uh, and, and here referred to also as uh, wyvern, uh, which is a two-legged dragon with wings and barbed tail. So um, it's like this, uh, this, this dragon kind of a thing. We are reminded of other dragons we have we have encountered in our readings this semester, in Beowulf and in the Saga of the Volsungs. And here we have Lohi changing herself into a, dra into a dragon. Now the North Dames is, uh, North's Dame, now the North's Dame is coming. The wondrous bird glides along as for shoulders, like a hawk, a wyvern as the body. She startles Vainamönen. Vainamönen doesn't easily get startled, but she startles Vainamönen. She flew on the masthead to the canvas tree rustled. On top of the post she perched, and the craft all but capsized. The ship nearly keeled over. So then Ilmarinen starts praying, keep a steadfast creator and guard us their lord. They know that this is this is serious. This is a serious battle. Uh, remember, she has brought a hundred or a thousand men under her wings and her tail, and um, and uh, Vainamoinen uh, talks uh, as he does, mistress of Northland. Uh, now will you share the sample on the misty headlands tip? at the foggy island's end. And uh, obviously the mistress of Northland, Lohi, answers, no, I'll not share the sample with you mean one, not with Vainamönen. And she tries to get the sample out of Vainamönen's boat. And there is this, there is this tug of things and uh, 
On page 569, uh, it goes on for a while, and um, the uh, Lohi, as this monster, uh, reached for the sample with her ring finger. She dropped the sample in the water, felt all the bright lid down over the red craft's side in the midst of the blue sea. There the sample came to bits and the bright lid to pieces. So sample is gone in the water in pieces, broken down. And that's where it is. Um, it's it, it's um, in the sea gods of this region. That's why never in this world, not in a month of Sundays, will the water go without or its ahto lack treasures. So the sun is there at the bottom of the sea, and that's why we get these treasures from the sea. We get salt from the sea, we get food from the sea. So, um, so th that's, that's the story of the sample. And Lohi goes, goes, goes ahead and, and she goes and curses, um, curses the Kalevala land and the entire Finland as it's sometimes referred to. And uh, of course, um, the, she's of course devastated and, and mad. So she says on page 571, I'll raise a bear from the heath, a gap tooth from the pine springs to crush your geldings and to kill your mares and to fell your herds and lay the cows low. People I'll kill with disease. I'll slay all your kin so that never more are they heard of in the world. So he curses Vainamunen and his people. And um, what happens is um, they depart. Nobody really won. Uh, the uh, Vainamunen and, and his men were able to to chase Lohi away, so they won in that sense. But the sample is gone. <laughs> so pieces of the sample, however, <laughs> were rescued. Um, this is um, on page 572. Uh, Lohi says, now the power has drained from me, my authority has failed, my property has foundered, the sample smashed in the waves. She's, she said, off homeward weeping, northward bewailing her luck. From all the sample she got nothing to speak of for, ho for home, but she did get a little with her ring finger, again, she bore the lid to Northland, brought the handle to Sariola, her Northland, another term for it. And that's why Northland is poor. Life in Lapland is breadless. So we, we, that's why we have these witches in the sea. That's why the North is a poor area of Finland, uh, or was, um, or has been. So you know we cut the, we get these some some of these explanations of why things are the way they are because of this story. So steady old Vanaman, and when he made landfall, when they got home, found bits of the deer sample and pieces of the bride lid upon the shore of the sea, upon the fine sands. He brought the bits of the deer sample, the pieces of the bride lid to the misty headlands tip, to the foggy islands end to grow to increase, to turn, to thicken, into barley beer, into loaves of bread. So pieces of sample are rescued and, uh, and, and it's still bringing this rye bread, not considered the, the wealthiest kind of, kind of bread, but, but still. 
so um, Bannerman and Praise, uh, grant creator, vouchsafe God, grant that we may be lucky, that we may live well always, that we may die with honor in Finland the sweet, in Karelia the fair. So here we have kind of like, you know, uh, Lundroth's national romanticism here. Keep us steadfast, creator, and guard us, fair God from the whims of men, from the wiles of hags. Overturn the earth envious, uh, defeat the water wizards, be on the side of your sons, always your children's helper, always a support by night and a protector by day. And, um, and support this place that you know we are here, we've got bits and, bits and pieces of the, of the sample. The last one we'll cover uh, today is the bird's cantele. So we are back in the Kalevala. Everybody's back here. Lohi is back in the Northland. So how is life going to continue? Um, Vandermanen's cantele has been lost together with the, you know, some breaking down in the water. And Vandermanen pondered in his brain now some music would be good and some merrymaking right for this new state of affairs upon these fair forums. But the cantele is lost. This is the pipe bone cantele. The cantele is lost. My joy has gone forever to the form of the fishes, to the cracks of the salmon, to the sea troughs uh, keepers, to the wave wives, eternal folk, nor will he, nor will it be brought again. Nor will Ahto give it back. So, what is he going to do? So he asks Smith Ilmarinen, forge me a, forge me a, a cantele. And Ilmarinen is like, um, uh, no. He asks him to forge him a rake so he could rake the pieces of the cantele. And Ilmarinen does, but Vainamoni cannot really uh, find the pieces of the of the cantele. So we so he encounters a birch tree, a speaking birch tree. Again we have a speaking tree with speaking boats and speaking trees and, and speaking animals and, and so on. So um, <coughs> first Vanamana sees that this birch tree is weeping a curly birch shedding uh, Tears. And Vanamon asks, Why do you weep, lovely birds? Green tree, why do you go on? White belt, why do you complain? You've seen a picture of a birch tree. It's, it's it got this white bark speckled with with black spots here and there. Um, gray spots. It's uh, it's beautiful, beautiful tree. Uh, it doesn't grow everywhere. It does grow in southern Finland and the, and the Karelia areas there on the on the east uh, southeastern Finland. So the birch uh, birch tree answers. Uh, well, some people say, certain people think that I live in joy, in in delight, revel, but lean in my cares, in my longings. I ring out, set forth in my suffering days, in sorrows murmur. Empty for my silliness, I weep, for my shortcomings complain. And, um, and she goes on to say that, you know, she's being kind of like abused. Um, Woe is me, I dread, having my bark stripped, my leafy twigs taking off. Um, often in my gloom, and often a gloomy wretch, children of the fleeting spring, come up close to me and with five knives slash my sappy belly open. Evil herdmen in summer take my white belt, the white bark, one of a drinking cone, one for a drinking cone, one for a sheath, one for a berry basket. So uh, from my from my twigs, uh, birch, uh, Bath whisks are made for the 
for the saunas, which is the central important place in, uh, in Finnish culture where people get born, they get healed, and they get, they, their bodies are put for washing when they, when they die, so it covers the entire. But anyway, the, the birch uh, whisks are used also in the sauna. You kind of like just whisk yourself. Um, so the you know to get to get clean, it's uh, self-flagellation of sorts, but it, it's relatively healthy and nice because the birch uh, whisk it smells really good and it makes the blood kind of like you know go around, so you feel really refreshed after that. But the birch tree is complaining, and I uh, I grabbed uh, before coming here. I just grabbed this from my from my shelf uh, to show you what kinds of things people in Finland actually make of birch bark. So this is of birch bark. It's not white anymore because it changes color, and uh, over years and years, it's probably decades old. So this is like you know you put it on <coughs> on the wall, and you can put stuff in there. And you make shoes like this of birch bark. And people, there are people in Finland who can still do this. Uh, later on, you make like uh, decorations. This is uh, not a pagan, uh, this is a Christian symbol, but uh, it's made out of birch bark. So uh, that's what the birch, birch tree is weeping that <laughs> I am being abused for all these things that people take of me. Nature cons conservation, here uh, a little bit. <coughs> and Vanamuna says, don't weep. I will make something out of you that in which you can live forever and make people, make people happy, give joy to people. And Vanamuna, Builds another company from the birch uh, wood, and uh, and he he builds this instrument, carved it through a summer day, hammered at a candle on a misty headland's tip at the foggy island's end, carved a belly for the candle, a sound boy for a for the new joy, a belly out of tough birch a sound soundboard of curly birch. So he's got the cantele, now he needs, pe needs pegs for the cantele. It's a simple, simple uh, uh, ingredients, so to say, that you need. So he uh, goes to an oak tree, he, he, there's an oak, and he makes oak pegs for the cantele. And uh, he still needs strings for the cantele. And he sees the young, beautiful girl, a lassie, sat in the blade, a young maiden on the marsh. The lass was not weeping, nor indeed was she rejoicing, but just singing to herself. She sang to pass her evening, hoping a bridegroom would come, thinking about her lover. Steady old Vanamonen. Yonder crept with no shoes on, without tall rags he tiptoed. Tall rags that you wrap around your uh, uh, your uh, feet before you put your shoes on. <laughs> Soldiers did that in the First World War, still Second World War. And um, if you don't have socks, okay. So uh, he began to beg tresses and he put this into words, this Vaneman is speaking to the beautiful girl, Lass, give some of your tresses, damsel of your hair, for Gandhana strings, voices of eternal joy. And now this is probably the first woman in the entire Kalevala who doesn't say no to Vaneman. And, and of course Vaneman is wise and is not asking this girl to be his wife, but he's asking something from this girl so that the girl can contribute to this beautiful instrument that Vaneman is building from the birch uh, wood with oak pegs. Now uh, the girl gives her hair as strings for the cantele. And, uh, and that's, that's the origin of the cantele. Vanamonen starts uh, playing 
And just like previously with the pike uh, jawbone cantele, uh, the nature, nature is resounding with the cantele sounds and everybody is happy. Um, all uh, young women with smiling lips, mistresses in merry mood to listen to the music marvel at the merriment. Um, it's, the sound is heard in six villages and even animals, again, they come to listen. Um, again, here we have the, you know, the blurring of the boundaries between human and non-human. We have, we have all kinds of animals coming to listen. Uh, even earthworms come to listen. They lift their heads from the, from the earth and they listen to Vaidemannen play. So the music is back. Um, the, the second cantele is not going to be lost. And uh, what we have left is um, uh, the Runos uh, 45. It's, it, it, we, we end today on a kind of like high note. This is beautiful music. Everybody is back home, but there, is, uh, there are bad things that, that are going to be happening. Uh, because of the antagonist Lohi in the Northland, and she's going to be sending some curses uh, the Kalevala way. And we'll go over those uh, next time, and also the final, final Bruno, which is number 50. Thank you.